Liberals, you know who you are. Okay, <laughs> Abby, can you get back to? <laughs> I, I love having a personal slave. This is good. Okay, can you turn the thing? Yeah. Abby's, we, could, we had electrical issues, so I normally do my own. This is why I wanted to find out who the liberals are, because you are being destroyed by Downton Abbey. And if you're a liberal, you probably don't watch Fox News, so you didn't even know you were being destroyed. So that's why I'm here. If you can learn nothing else tonight, you've learned this, you're welcome. Um, and uh, if you're wealthy, uh, whether conservative or liberal, immersion in Downton Abbey will certainly cause you to desperately need a butler of your own. Um, and I'm not wealthy and I feel like I need one, so. Uh, Downton Abbey mania is everywhere and until I began prepping this talk, I had no idea how the breadth of its popularity and subsequent commercial tie-ins because we're Americans, that is what we do. Um, out on the street, sales of long silk gloves, Pearls and Ampere waist dresses have soared since Downton Abbey aired. The popularity of Downton Abbey and its beautiful costumes have inspired a whole new demand for 1900s through 1920s fashion. And it's, it's extraordinary, the impact that has had. There are online quizzes to help you in determining which character you'd be, <laughs> job you'd have, even which couple you identify with. Screening parties are popular through most of um, the Western media markets, and I even got, I've done, this is I think the third, second or third time I've done this talk, and I got contacted by a gentleman who's in charge of Vermont Public Television, and apparently to help ask me to come and to do uh, a spiel at their, uh, the Downton Abbey Gala that they have. I think it's the third and fourth in Essex, and oh my God, it is, there are wine tastings, there's um, uh, Emily Post Etiquette Manor Lady, the people wear costumes and there are prizes for the one who looks the most like whoever. I mean, it's this huge, huge thing with the Vermont Orchestra. Um, and it is, apparently the one in Essex is the second largest in the country. In our little tiny Vermont, hello Vermont, yes. And, uh, but, but this is not uncommon throughout the country. There are such things. Uh, this is actually from the, that um, celebration or gala in Essex, they have a, a green screen so that people in period costume can stand in front of it and have period, look, period looking photos. Uh, if anyone is interested in that event, if you just Google uh, Downton Abbey and Vermont Public Television. Um, if attending, however, if attending a Downton Abbey party in period costume is not your cup of tea, Abby, chop chop, <laughs> um, you, you can find solace in playing Downton Abbey bingo. So see, this is, this is when you're alone, you're not like, you, you, you just, it's not that you're not popular, you are popular. It's that you'd rather, I love my time alone, my alone time. So if I want my alone time, but I kind of want the sharing that can be part of watching Downton Abbey with others, I get my Downton Abbey bingo card out, and then every time someone does one of the Mary Cries, I get to put down a mark, all of the things, you know. Thomas checks out the new footmen, mark that. Um, it, you know, it's a way to, to enlarge the experience. Um, or you're alone, you don't want to play the Downton Abbey bingo, you can also just douse yourself in Downton of Olay. Um, <laughs> other commercial tie-ins include jewelry, uh, teas, Downton Abbey uh, costumes have inspired many contemporary fashion designers. None more than Ralph Lauren. Uh, and this one is also Lauren. Oh, uh, Abby, you're moving ahead a little fast here. <laughs> um, there are Downton Abbey costume sketches which are not the costume sketches of the designer. The designer doesn't do sketches. So this is just somebody who took a costume class and said, I want to make some money. Um, there are also Downton Abbey paper dolls. Love these. Uh, Downton Abbey trading cards. And this, these are my, the next one are my favorite trading cards. My veins are full of secrets. I don't know about the rest of you. I miss O'Brien, loved O'Brien. Um, and finally, under the heading of, you know you've made it when. <laughs> yes, yes, when the Muppets decide to do you, you, you have gained a certain stature. Now why all the fuss? I can only speak for myself. 
I just think it's awesome. It's to me, it's television at its finest. There is a dearth of good original programming, I believe, for me. Uh, the reality TV um, and and the dramas that are on are very violent, and so. Um, to me, it, it embodies two of my favorite things, a good story and gorgeous clothes. What's not to love, okay? Um, the characters on Downton Abbey, in fact, are so well designed that it can be rather shocking um, to be reminded that they're real people, okay? <laughs> I looked at this picture and it's like, who are you people? I mean, what is this? And, and when I do, I, you know, because in terms of doing research for this, I. I do a lot of Google imaging, and it's just outrageous to me that these people dare to, these women wear makeup and short skirts. Don't you know you have, you know, you have a reputation to withhold? Um, uh, Phyllis Logan, to me, is one of the best achieved. You know, when you see her out of, what's her character's name? Mrs. Hughes. When she's not Mrs. Hughes, she looks like, who is this person? Um, the most visual way that the series charts the passage of time is through fashion. Um, so far it has taken us from 1912 to 1924. Uh, here we are in 1912 and 1924 and those skirts are going to continue to get shorter, folks. Although, you know, a lot of people who will do 20s costumes just socially for a Halloween party or something take it to an extreme, they never got a lot shorter than Rose's is there. Just below the knee is as short as it got. Um, and in terms of showing the passage of time, I think one of the best ways in which it's reflected in, in terms of posture, movement, and clothing is seeing a corset timeline like this. And you, you know, these women started out with their bodies just squeezed in, uh, seriously. Uh, 18 inch waist, 19 inch waist, and, and when, uh, for myself as a theatrical costumer, I do this to young women all the time. Um, and, and I tell you, by the time you've trained them in, we break them in 15 minutes at a pop, then enlarge it to 20, 25. By the time the show opens, the girls are saying, can't you, can't you lace it tighter? They really get used to it. But we have absolutely seen uh, a transformation in the timeline of the female silhouette. Um, and this is the lingerie that they're wearing now when we return to the series in January. You know, very, very, if anything, women are binding their breasts if they have much bosom because a flat chest is, is very fashionable. Boyish figure is very fashionable during the 20s. They're for, the, for those of us who are a little um, uh, more senior, uh, we'll remember the 60s as also being a very strong parallel between the silhouette in the 60s and the 20s. Um, Aside from some minor set dressing, the, series, the settings of series one through five really are frozen in time. When you think about it, there's not a lot else that tells us that we are in a different period than the clothes. Granted, we have the cars, we have the toaster. Remember the toaster? <laughs> Love the toaster. Um, but aside from these things, and I think we're going to get, a you know, we have a telephone now too, um, there aren't a lot of other ways to, to illustrate the modernity of the times. The series is really dependent on costume to tell us what year or what decade it is. Um, executive producer Gareth Neem uh, acknowledges this, and he's shown here with actress Laura Carmichael, who plays poor Edith. Um, and, and to quote Neem, the costume designer is really part of the producing team because she has a huge amount to do with the telling of the story. Let me tell you, as someone who's designed a lot of shows, that is not something directors or producers usually like to say. Um, so it's, it's very notable. Uh, because this passage of time is primarily illustrated through ladies' clothes, my chat tonight is going to focus on the ladies. Um, each series, so we're now, we're about to begin series, season five. Each season um, has had multiple directors and cinematographers. Uh, this adds to the feeling of freshness uh, and energy on set during pre-production, filming, edit, so forth. Um, any guesses on how many different directors there have been? Twelve. There have been twelve different directors. Um, that said, there's a lead director for each season um, who oversees the rehearsals for each block. 
Um, and given this, it, to me, it's even more impressive when you hear that, that they, the continuity, that the look, the characterizations, that there has been uh, a strong uh, sense of continuity. Uh, and I think the consistent look is largely due to the presence of the, the um, producer who's on site all the time, Liz Truebridge. And she's shown there, the woman on the left, on your right, wearing white, uh, is with Thomas. We all know from Evil Thomas from the series. Um, uh, another key player in why we love this show uh, is Alistair Bruce, shown here. And he is their historical advisor, and he's brilliant and knows everything and is also charming and delightful. Being English does not hurt that, but he is. Um, did anyone notice that there had been a change in costume designer since the, the show's inception? Well, that just shows you how good they are, right? Uh, there have been two different costume designers. Um, typically, costumes, ha uh, the first, I lost my spot here. Um, there are two different costume designers. The first designer it was Susanna Buxton, and she did series one and four, season one and four. And her assistant designer, uh, Carolyn McCall, designed series three and four. Uh, and no doubt, the fact that she was Susanna's assistant helped a whole lot in this, you know, seamless, get it, so costumes, seams, seamless transition. I'll be here all night. Um, and uh, t typically, costumes have seven weeks of prep before the filming begins. And you, you have to, when you watch one episode, right, there's a lot of clothes and a lot going on and a bunch of different locations. Uh, and these are people who are still changing their clothes five times a day, thank you very much, uh, called conspicuous division, whereby changing your clothes for all these different meals and events and so forth is, again, a mark of your, um, your status in society. The costume budget per episode is about 31 to 41,000, which may sound like a lot, but uh, given the fact that Lord Grantham's dinner jacket here alone cost 4200 just that jacket. You know, we're not talking the tie or the pants. Um, McCall found she follows the same creative process and working practice begun by Buxton and gets her inspiration uh, the same way I do, from myriad sources, detailed illustrations, and basically puts together storyboards and tear sheets of research to share with the actors, to share with the directors. Um, and a way to show her ideas. Um, vintage fashion magazines are particularly useful. And then there are also iconic historical figures. Uh, Queen Alexandra, shown here, uh, served as the inspiration for Violet's costumes initially. And you can still see a bit of that. Uh, Alexandra was a contemporary, would have been a contemporary of Violet's. And she was mother, mother to King George V. And she was considered a fabulous fashion icon. Uh, so she's the kind of woman that a woman like Violet would have looked to, particularly in terms of how she adapted her style to the post-war years and the years of the war. Uh, Alexandra always wore a high neckline because she had a scar on her neck from a childhood operation. And you'll see that Violet does the very same thing. Uh, and this is one of my favorite things. I teach the history of fashion. And throughout the history of fashion, kings and queens have worn stuff and done stuff that we, as the lower people, I would be a lower people, all, oh, we do that. We go, oh, he shaved his head. I'm going to do that. That's fabulous. And, and we, the people never find out that the reason he shaved his head is because hot coals got thrown at him. And that's, you know, he really didn't think that would be chic. But we all, people always copy the royals. So again, she's a wonderful example of, of following that um, fashion that Alexandra put forth simply because she had a scar. Um, during the costume prep period, McCall works from offices at a costume company called Cosprop. And that is the second biggest costume house in London. Uh, just a little overhead view of some of their racks. Uh, and also Ealing Studios is where, is it, and that's the most oldest, most continuously operating studio in the world. Downton Abbey has workrooms at Cosprop and at Ealing. Ealing is where all the servant scenes are filmed. 
all the downstairs scenes, whether they're in the, uh, at the servant's table, in the kitchen, or in servant's quarters, are all film, filmed in Ealing Studios. Um, for the seats, so, uh, the staff at Cosprop does the menswear and servant uniforms. Here we're going to see uh, there's an aerial view of Cosprop. And this is uh, Sarah Humphreys, who runs the workroom for Downton Abbey, and diligently ironing away in, in their studio. Um, she does much of the cutting and construction for the ladies' gowns, in addition to the beating. I mean, this woman is amazing. Uh, from the first meeting with each actor, Buxton has a rack uh, with a variety of styles and shapes appropriate to the period. I think I'm out of order here just a little bit. There we go. Um, the first fitting is about determining what kind of line looks good on someone. So that when I do a fitting too, I may in my mind think this particular costume is exactly what I want to use on someone, but until I get that particular actor in a fitting room and try different shapes on them, that is very telling in terms of what, what is a flattering on them. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about. What's flattering on them and what they feel good about. Uh, if you dress an actor in a way that, they don't, that isn't positive for them, they're not going to be able to do their best work. So it's definitely a collaboration. And it's more of a collaboration the more status you have as an actor, the more collaboration you're going to bring to it because your reputation as a professional is on the line. So um, it, it truly is a, a, a team process. She photographs anything that works um, to use it for ideas. I also want to talk a bit about the collaboration between the costume designer and um, the art director. Uh, and the costume designer and the art director need to work very closely together so that scenes like this work. And this is a beautifully costumed scene within the context of the surround. Um, this is an example, though. So the art director's job is to decorate each room. And even though um, High Clare is a, it's a functioning ca a castle, I mean, it is, people live there. Um, when they are shooting Downton Abbey, and that's usually from, I think, January to March or April, they definitely renovate it. I mean, they change the decor quite significantly, particularly carpets, furniture, plants, and so forth, to reflect the fashion of whatever era is being shown. Um, but this is a room that the art director has done. It's called the Green Room. And you can see the difference that bringing the clothes into it makes. And here we see the same room and with evening lighting, with the candlelight, the fire, and, and it's, a, it's got a beautiful quality to it. It's very clear that there has been consideration for the set, which is what I would say in my theater world. Um, here, though, even though I love, who did not love this, uh, the bossed you know, takeoff that Civil War, but you can see how we really lose Cora. So to me, this, is, this was not a successful choice for Cora in this scene, because she really kind of gets lost in the set. Um, here we have the Great Hall. And, and look up where the arches are. This is without people, with people. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful surround. You know, by this time in the history of fashion, I, my, my joke when I teach costume history is that all the men, because until, really, until the 17th century, until the 18th century, men looked fabulous. Women were, we were all kind of like, eh, but the men looked awesome and very elaborate. And I swear to God, at some point, they just said, you know, this, you know, this coat is killing me. And all this, yeah, don't you find, oh, yes, Charles, can we talk? It's terrible. And so I think they, you know, they smoked cigars, drank sherry, and all decided to simplify their dress and put it on the backs of the women. And that is really you know, what happened from the mid-18th seven, mid century on, that, that men's dress continues to simplify till the 19th century, early 20th, when they're really wearing black. It's not until the mid-20s where we will begin to see men taking on a little more color and a little more panache in their dress. But they really, as you can see, they're just background for the ladies. Um, let's see. Uh, do, 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 around here. 
Um, many pieces, again, of vintage fabric are found through costume houses, shopping trips to Paris, oh my, uh, as a way to lend period authenticity to the garments. Um, many of the dresses, where am I here, I'm sorry. Many of the dresses incorporate these kinds of fabrics. It's very difficult, though, to use authentic clothes. And actually, can you go back one, please? Thank you. Um, it's very difficult to use authentic clothes. Because Sybil was so tiny when she was in the show, um, to me, this image really shows you uh, the three ways you can do clothes for a series like this. One, Sybil is uh, shocked. So they found, went to a vintage house and found that dress, and it was still able to be worn. Um, Mary's stuff is almost always built because she is a tall girl, and Edith was rented from a costume rental house, which just, again, supports the old poor Edith thing, right? <laughs> um, but there are three different ways, and again, I think it takes a very, very good eye, though, as a designer to put those three together and not have one of them yell out, you know, I'm the new one, I'm the this one. It's very difficult to build new things and combine them with older pieces and not have there be a, a tell. Can you do the next one, please? Um, I included this one because the, this dress that Daisy is wearing, and I think this is from season one, is one of the only original women's pieces that have been used in the series. Next one. Uh, this is the kind of... Um, bits of trims and silks and beading that they really focus on um, collecting. And it, again, to, it lend, to me, it lends that truth, it lends that accuracy, that authenticity to a made costume when some bits of the past can be included. Uh, this is just gorgeous. I just, I mean, as a, as a costume designer myself, I love fabric. I just, fabric is like, no. And it's all right there with chocolate, okay? Can, that, that should tell you something. Um, and no calories, though, so it's better. And this is, but this is just, again, sort of the world of that. Next, please. Uh, a lot of, so, so what you'll find, now that you know this, you can go back and watch all the series and say, uh, I know how they did that dress. Because once you're clued in, this is an example of having found a stunning piece of antique metallic lace and combining it with some red silk chiffon. Uh, and again, the same thing here is that Cora's bodice, uh, the, the center front piece is an antique piece of goods and you know, a, a, a more a simple, somewhat dipped down silk is used to complement that in this dress. Uh, each daughter was given her own color initially, her own palette. So the actress playing Mary was given strong colors, blues, burgundies. Uh, we had Sybil uh, in mauves and blues. And Edith was in ambers, ochres, greens, and pale pinks. And that still is fairly true of Edith. What has happened, though, as the series developed, the color world became more fluid. So that initially, when we were introduced to all these people, and I think of watching the very first episode, there's all these people, how do you keep them straight? So I think the storyline, the costume storyline on each daughter needed to be very specific and very different, very contrasting. And when I design, the first thing I do is, is thinking about, okay, there are these 20 characters in this play, how do they contrast with each other? All these women, which one's the richest? Which one's the prettiest? Which one's the, so that I can use that kind of vocabulary in in choosing what their clothes are. So again, here you, you see the, the color story that I mentioned earlier being continued. Um, once the, the show, once we became more familiar with the girls, it wasn't so critical for to have these sharp color stories. And you can see that I think these three dresses, although the colors are quite different, because the fabric has a strong similarity, they all work together. Um, and again, as the show progressed, the need for a strong color definition lightened. But here you can see, even though their palette is very similar, there's a difference in style, where Sybil is more bohemian, Mary is a little bit more classic, and, well, Edith is Edith. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, this is Mary in her wedding dress. At, to me, to my mind, one of McCall's greatest challenges was in the bridal gown designs for season three. Can you um, make that one bigger? Or not, it's okay. No. It's okay. Uh, anyway, we, we all saw this dress, right? Stunning, yes. Uh, one of her, what she wanted to do was make Mary's wedding dress contrast with how hard and cold Mary had been uh, as a single woman. She wanted her to look softer, understated, delicate, and romantic. Uh, and she also wanted Mary to shimmer. So the fashion at the time was for lace or satin. She knew that lace would be better for Mary. Uh, and Swarsky provided the crystals and they were hand sewn onto the dress. Uh, this is from the tiara. The, uh, this is, was an 1830s diamond tiara rented from Bentley and Skinner in London. The frame was altered so that it could be worn lower on the head, valued at 205,000 pounds. Pounds are more than dollars. Uh, this tiara, when, when you do film, you have, you have set costumers. So I think most people know about what it's like on film shoots nowadays because there's all these behind the scene things. But there are set costumers so that every time, um, every time a, a, you as an actor, or they say cut, and they're about to reshoot it, I'll come, I, I wouldn't as the costume person, I might check your scarf, and the makeup and hair person might, I forgot I have my dog here, um, the makeup and hair person might uh, powder you, make sure your hair is in place. This, so there's a set costumer who helps all the actors. This tiara had its own set costumer <laughs> because it was worth that much. Um, can anyone tell me where we see this tiara a second time? Dun 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 dun. What? Who said that? Thank you for being fabulous and smart. Yes. We would have been here all night. Wouldn't have been pretty. Yes. Um, a family like the Crawleys would have had a family tiara, of course. Don't we all have family tiaras? Would have had a family tiara that was handed down through generations. So that although each girl would have her own dress, the tiara was something that had been worn forever. Uh, so here is Edith wearing the tiara. Um, there were two considerations in designing Edith's wedding dress, the two big considerations. One obvious, Edith had to look pretty as a bride, right? She had to look beautiful because brides do that. And it had to be all um, the, the impact of rejection at the altar was much more powerful dramatically because she looked so stunning. But as important as how she looked at the altar was how she looked, and now let me get to that, how she looked at the altar was how she looked when she hurled herself onto her bed. I mean, I, I tried to find an, a still image of that to show you, but so powerful and poetic. And when she throws her, uh, I think it was her veil, down the, down the, the um, from the second level, and it just floated down, it was just gorgeous. Um, absolutely stunning. Uh, during the past two seasons, I have loved, love, love, love the contrast. Talk about, I, I want to get out a saucer of milk when they're on um, you know, film together. I mean, just wow. I, I, watched, I watched the last episode of season four last night just to kind of prime myself for seeing you. And the scene where, um, where Shirley MacLaine follows uh, Violet upstairs, you know, and says, oh, you're going to bed, oh yes, you're old, you need to go to bed, and just, uh, you know, some serious, but the contrast between their clothes are, is so accurate and so fabulous in terms of showing contrast, also because I think frequently in design the same palette is used, so that we're able to see how with line and form a completely different kind of character can emerge. Um, McCall fl flew out to LA to fit McLean, uh, and the costumes for Mrs. Levinson absolutely illustrate her eagerness to embrace the latest fashions. And as a nouveau riche American, she's very showy, because that, again, is what nouveau riche Americans do. I'm going to leave, though, the, the sort of um, 
philosophical world of costume design and take you behind the scenes because that's what's really interesting, I think, for many of us. So we're going to move on to on-set filming. All of the below stair scenes, and again, most of the bedroom interiors are shot at Ealing. And the reason for that is the, the Highclere Castle has consistently been in use throughout the years. And Highclere, as most uh, homes of this size in, in England, um, had converted the downstairs in the 20s, 30s, or 40s, it had stopped having the massive servants that people had at this time, so the downstairs was converted so that it isn't possible to do. I mean, that the working kitchen and um, servants' quarters, all of those things just don't exist at High Clare anymore, and it's much easier to film it when it's set up in a studio context. They initially started filming the bedrooms at High Clare uh, and again, it was difficult for them to get the right angles, get the right sound, and so forth. Um, so what we see on TV is really the, the downstairs, the main rooms, the scenes where the dining room, the entry room, looking down from the second level, those things, and on the outside of the grounds are all true to the estate. Um, for these locations, though, because again, they're not allowed, they have to respect this building, so they're not allowed to actually take over as scene crews often do. Uh, film crews often will just take over the whole house uh, and use one as wardrobe and use one for makeup. That isn't something that they can do in this space. So they basically move in with a whole lot of trailers uh, and vans and so forth. Um, and the trailer becomes the mobile costume studio. Although the costumes are built at Ealing Studios often weeks before filming, uh, actors usually have what we call a check fit. So that we may have had a fitting um, with you know, whatever actor it is and gotten the dress all figured out and the accessories, but oftentimes, because film, filming is such an expensive business, you cannot risk not having something be there and work perfectly. So that it is very cost effective to get someone in the day before and check and make sure that everything's a go. Uh, particularly because actors have been known to gain weight. Uh, it happens. I said that sarcastically. Um, eh, so let's look inside one of these trailers. This is the wardrobe trailer. This is the wardrobe supervisor here. Um, you'll see some men's clothes hanging there. Uh, these are the daily call. Can you turn it? There. Uh, if you look, again, I don't know that you can look closely, but you'll see a photograph hanging from that sheet of paper on the left. Do you see that? Um, and those are the continuity shots. So every time when you're working in film and you use an actor in a scene, you will write specific notes about how their garment is worn, take pictures, so that when the, the next scene, if it again is continuous action or it's in another frame or in another room, you can be sure to match that. Okay, very important. So that's, you know, that's as important as clothes looking good, is getting the continuity right. Um, this, I want you to take a look and see if anybody can read. What does that say on that bin? Oh, I forget, I have my thing. No, nobody? Well, I looked at it when I was prepping this, and I am pretty sure it says women's thermal bottoms. <laughs> and I don't know about you, I watch this show religiously. I have not seen anyone wearing women's thermal bottoms. Have you? I mean, what, what's going on? Has this lady got a business on the side? Um, in addition to all the costumes that we see in the series, the trailer is also filled with women's thermal bottoms, women's thermal tops, blankets, and puffer coats. Okay, Vermonters, why are those things in the trailer? It's cold. It is cold. High Clear Castle, uh, according to uh, producer Liz Truebridge, it's got its own microclimate. Even on a hot day, it's cold. On a cold day, it's freezing. Uh, so, you know, any time an actor is not on camera, you see them. I have more pictures in my laptop of actors in puffer coats 
wearing different kinds of hats and hairstyles. Here they are again. The women are all wearing wigs because it's quicker than styling their own hair. Um, but you can see t once they do the wig, they use a net to keep the wind from changing it at all. But again, the puffer coats are huge. And again, now we know underneath the satiny dresses, they are wearing thermal bottoms. See, you, you will be able to know things that others won't. Uh, again, here we have thermal coat time. Uh, this is the scene I'm pretty sure, yeah, this was Edith's wedding. This was shot in January. No, I'm sorry, mid-February at bitterly cold, bitterly cold. And again, we all saw that wedding. It looked like a nice summer day to me. Um, again, depicting a summer's day. All the cast was in these light summer clothes, la, 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 and freezing their kahunis off. So right off camera, here we see <laughs> wardrobe people with hot water bottles. We've got, uh, yeah, the down coats. You notice that Isabel does not look very happy there. Yeah, there we have, okay. Uh, Jim, this is a Jim Carter quote, which I love. Jim Carter, filming is a bit like life in service. There's a lot of waiting and then moments of frenetic activity. Uh, we call it, when I worked in film, we called it hurry up and wait. I mean, you work so fast, so hard, and then you just stand around for hours and hours and hours. And when you're in the crew, at least we're busy because we've got a lot of work to do for the upcoming scenes. But actors, literally, I mean, they just sit around a lot. So I, I watched him on an interview recently, and he is the president of his cricket club. So he said, well, there's, so much, there's nothing to do, but I, I call the members and I schedule the next game and I, I talk to the treasurer, so he's busy and apparently board games are very big. Um, the actress playing Daisy has her own trailer, but she really wants to hang out with everybody else. They're a very, very social group. And apparently, um, who is it? I think it's um, the actress who's playing, uh, who's the poor sad one? Who's husband just disappeared, or boyfriend just, yeah, Edith is apparently fleecing them all a board game. She's, she's a, a killer, from what I understand. Uh, this is a call sheet, and so when you work in film, you get one of these every day, and this breaks down all the different filming that is happening and, and what time actors are called, which is certainly pertinent, because if you're doing costume or hair or makeup, you need to know when they need to be where. So it's at a glance a really great sheet. What they do at, um, for Downton Abbey is they'll be filming um, below stair, they'll, they'll be filming things with the family at Highclere simultaneously while filming stuff at Ealing Studios using the servants. So those things are, are often being done at the same time. Um, earlier I cited the inclusion of vintage textiles into many of the ladies' dresses. Um, again, integrating the vintage textiles into these costumes is not without its hazards. So again, Sybil's costume was designed uh, after Poiret, who's a hugely important designer from about 1908 to World War I, did had a strong Turkish influence in his clothes. Um, and this was a, the, the figure on the right was an original design of his, and again, they used that to reflect uh, Lady Sybil's uh, freedom and style and so forth. But what happened, uh, and here we see it on camera, but because the fabric was so fragile, is that every between every take, they had to run and sew her up again. I mean, it had to continually get restitched. Uh, and here is Carolyn McCall in one of those little stitching emergencies. Um, According to Jason Gill, men's wardrobe, it's a constant battle to keep the men's, the costumes looking good, especially with the male actors. Uh, keeping makeup off the starched collars and keeping the, the, the creases where you want them in the pants. And this is the thing, these male, these men want to sit down in their pants off camera. I mean, it, it's terrible when you're a costume person. You want to come, these collars, if, if any of the gentlemen here ever worn one of these stiff paper collars? You should. I should have brought some. I should have, we have a whole thing of them. And they literally are like a corset for the neck. And men nowadays, 
Not only don't wear these, but they wear, when I watch the news, I just grrr, because they'll wear a man who has a 15 and a half neck will wear a 16 and a half or a 17 shirt because it's comfortable. And I fit my hand back there. It's really not the way it's supposed to be. Um, the actors of both genders portraying all classes, though, they all acknowledge the pain that their costumes cause them, and they all agree that it's worth it in terms of what it does for them in their carriage, in their performances. So, you know, the ladies unanimously despised their courses, but they understood the role that it played in helping them evoke the period and walk in a manner that's appropriate to the period and look like that period. There is no way you're going to achieve that silhouette and that, that posture wearing, you know, contemporary undergarments. Again, here's another shot of the, the beautiful underwear they get to wear now. Easy, easy underwear. Uh, Hugh Bonneville uh, it quoted in saying, stiff collars are a pain in the neck, quite literally. Get it? But they affect your bearing and make you stand up properly. Uh, since scenes are often shot, shot out of sequence, it's a common practice to have duplicates. Many of you know about that, right? The, the duplicates. So that any time you see a movie or a TV show where there's a fight, where there's war, where there's action, God knows where there's shooting, like many, most movies nowadays and many of the TV series have uh, shooting, there have to be at least five of that costume that that actor is wearing. Because you have to, things are almost always shot out of sequence. So that I did, I worked on a movie where we had a little boy going, he was in a, um, he was in a mortuary and then he was in a, 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 a a, a grave, and then he went through a tunnel, and then and out, and they shot the end first, and that's often the case. So that, for example, when you saw the war scenes, we saw Matthew looking like that, but we also saw Matthew looking like that. And this is the only time, from the research I've done on the show, this is the only time where costumes was heard. So costumes said, "Listen." The, the color of the mud, there's a place in England where they do world, fabulous World War I shoot, and that's where they went to do the World War I stuff, but even there trying to match the mud and the dirt is very difficult to do it after the fact. So this is the only show I've ever heard of where they actually heard that and allowed it to be shot in sequence. But even then, you need to have multiples so that you, we see the same garment, we believe it's the same garment, but they're actually, you know, there's a rack like this of that very same costume hanging in his trailer. So there are multiples of anything you see more than one. Anything that undergoes so that when we saw um, the actor who is such a jerk, Thomas. We saw Thomas and didn't he get beat up after the county fair or something? Definitely there were doubles on that costume. And we call them doubles whether or not they're 12. It's just doubles is the language that you use. Um, I included this because I wanted to, to be, be sure to remember to tell you the other reason why there sometimes are multiples, and that's when there are body doubles. So we all know about stunt people, right? That's pretty common. Um, didn't know, though, that if you were to rewatch the DVD of the cricket match, remember how Thomas is the hero of the cricket match, he can't play cricket to save his soul, that actor. <laughs> Terrible cricket player. So again, they had to have a body double for his cricket costume. Um, here we are down in the kitchen. Um, one th a lot of press has been given. I think that's right. Yeah. A lot of press has been given to the fact that they film um, all the downstairs scenes at Ealing Studios. Tap and the upstairs scenes at Highclere Castle. The problem that ensues is that the, the, the kitchen staff, what is the name of our fabulous cook? I love her. <laughs> Mrs. Patmore prepares this wonderful food and gives it to Thomas or to one of them, says, bring that up, bring that kitchen. Why are you just standing there looking at it? Take that upstairs. They walk away with the tray, oops, my thing. They walk away with the tray and, and they walk they can't walk to Highclere Castle because that's like, you know, another 40 miles away. So they have to, trying to do the continuity on the food for those moments is a killer. So that food is cold. 
Um, but, but the continuity photos for that are particularly important. And actors, if you've watched any of the behind the scenes, behind the scenes stuff, this is it's the dining room of death. Because they sit there forever, and if there are you know, 12 people at the table, they have to shoot the entire scene from each actor's angle, from, each, from their perspective, and all the food needs to get re, you know, re, it's, it's a long, arduous process. Um, that's the, it from the props and food end. But also in costumes, remember that the bedrooms are at Ealing Studios. And all the times that you see them upstairs in their bedrooms, the ladies putting on their gloves, getting ready, there are times um, when they'll, someone will be you know, having a romantic moment or an intense discussion, they walk down the stairs and they appear for dinner again. That's two weeks later or two weeks before. Uh, in addition to housing clothing for the principal cast, the trailers also serve as costume collections on wheels for the extras. Whether it's the village fair, uh, prisoners, Mary's wedding, Buckingham Palace, or the, here we have, I'm sorry, Army Buckingham Palace. Extras are always dressed in a separate trailer and the tradition for extras is low hanging fruit. You know, you have a whole lot of clothes in a variety of sizes, the extras appear, you hand them the clothes, they put them on, and that's what they wear. And it was very difficult for me as a costume designer training theater to, to make that transfer. I mean, to make that transition to not caring deeply about everything that they wear. The people who, are, who do the village scenes have almost become a second principal cast because they live in that village. And so their clothes are pretty much set. Um, the, what did I want? the series four had a dark beginning. As we all know, um, six months after Matthew's death, England was still adjusting to the new rules. If you watch um, Bill Maher, he does new rules. Uh, and new rules were actually becoming to be in place. There was, uh, from the time of Queen Victoria's um, reign in 18, I think it was 1861, Prince Albert died. Okay? And she assumed mourning for the rest of her reign. Uh, this led to an insane popularity and protocol related to dressing for mourning. And throughout England and throughout the United States, because everybody in the United States wanted to, wanted to follow England in terms of the fashions, England and France, and uh, th there was an enormous etiquette around dressing for mourning. And a woman, this, this I love, any feminist in the group, this I love. Women had to dress for mourning. If your partner died, you had to dress for mourning for two and a half years. If, if your wife died, you had to wear an armband for a month. I mean, hello? And seeing a little imbalance there? All right? Plus, they get the property. It's just not fair. Uh, and so the first year and a half, you had to be in solid black crepe. And then the next eight months, you had lesser crepe. And, and depending upon your relationship to the, the person who deceased, so that you may notice in the, one of the first episodes, you know, the Titanic has been sunk. I think that's how we open the series. And you'll see the daughters almost immediately wearing kind of a lavender color. And that was an accepted for like distant relatives. You could wear plum or lavender lilac for the first bit of time. So it was strictly protocol and strictly regulated amongst, you know, even lower class people certainly would wear um, the black for an extensive period of time. What happens to change that is World War One. World War One, so many people died, so many men died, that if everyone had followed the traditional practice of wearing black to the extent that the Victorians and Edwardians had, it would have, it would have sh people would have shot themselves, even if they'd survived the war. It would have been too grim. So what we had after World War I was the disintegration of that very strict social order etiquette related to, to gr dressing grieving. Um, one of the reasons that the producers made it six months later in, in terms of the beginning of uh, season four was so that we wouldn't have to spend the entire series in black. 
Um, and as it is, because again, things are lightening up, Mary shifts to a little bit of color by the last episode or two. Um, it, it was a very, very dark series. I, I found that in addition to Mary's gloom and sorrow and the, the darkness and the fact that the entire High Claire even felt like it was in a fog, there was also the brutal assault of, yeah, of Anna, which was as or worse, you know, devastating. And so it was a very, very dark um, time. Here we have Queen Victoria with her children um, and more of Mary. Uh, however, as we, you know, on the other side, we moved into the 20s in the last series. Uh, the 20s, as m most women I think probably know, uh, is, a, is the decade of the cloche. And with the cloche, you know, women, it's the first time in the history of fashion women cut their hair short. And one of the reasons they did that is that was the only way you could wear a cloche. You couldn't wear a cloche if you had long hair. Um, and it is a testament to the mastery of the hairstylists on the show that some of these actresses have long hair and the way they wrap it and conceal it and still make the cloche work on their heads. Um, but, but again, they're very popular. You see the influence of 20s fabrics. Um, it's a sleeker head. Uh, and there's a new modernism in terms of the colors and the textures that are using. I personally love the fact that we finally got to see Edith shine. Um, and some more vivid colored uses, I think that the, uh, McCall loved dressing rose in some of the more um, youthful, vibrant kinds of choices that are emblematic to the 20s. Uh, and it was wonderful seeing Edith come into her own who had, you know, the, the style point for Edith had been in the previous seasons, she was never quite right. There was always something that wasn't quite right about her sense of style. And she's, it, there, there is a comfort in the way she presents herself as a woman in season four. Uh, this dress is, is, to me, just loved this dress. And there's a wonderful story about it, too. Uh, this is the dress that Edith wears when she goes to the London restaurant. Uh, showing a new silhouette, uh, but again, the design on this dress holds true to everything I've told you from the very beginning of the series in the way this dress was designed and made. In her research tear sheets for season four, McCall included the work, that's a tear sheet right there, she included the work of French artist Georges Barbier. Uh, here's another example of his work. On a shopping trip to Paris, she found a beaded and sequined piece of fabric. It was remounted, sewn into a bodice, as we see here, uh, and the rest of the dress was built around it using chiffon. Uh, this dress was nicknamed Beadeth by the costume <laughs> department. Uh, season five will take place six months after the conclusion of season four in the mid-20s. Uh, it, the occasion is Robert and Cora's 34th anniversary. Now, I did some research about the season because it's already playing in Britain. Uh, so, you know, if you are really curious about what's happening in the show, you can watch it on your laptop. You can read things on your, on your um, you know, say what the latest is. It's there. I didn't feel that I wanted the moral responsibility of telling you that. <laughs> I thought, I like, I don't want to know. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to know. So, but do know it's very accessible. The, the one thing, the, the thing to know is that it is lighter and it is, um, I, I've heard that these are t three of the guests, new, new actors on the show. To me, the best news of the whole thing is knowing that Lady Mary gets back to her bitch himself, okay? <laughs> Sniping Mary is alive and well. Matthew's dead, I can't help it, but I'm gonna snark at people. And, and that alone is, is a wonderful, glorious gift. The other thing that I know that some of you know that, I, that I, was news to me till I looked it up, um, is who one of the, the guest actors will be for their Christmas episode. So if you don't want to know, I'm not going to say the name, if you don't want to know, uh, just close your eyes for one minute, and I'll tell you when to open again. Oh. Yeah. Go back, go back. <laughs> no? Can you go back? Yeah, yeah. So that, again, eyes closed. Okay, and, and with that, I will say, that's, I don't know what, the, what that's doing there. Um, it, it's a wrap. 
So thank you. Any questions? Any questions? No, yes. Say 
you make this stuff for us for not, you know, for very cheap, and we'll give it to you after we're done with the shoot. And because again, they're going through the history of fashion. All that stuff they did for the in the 1914 to 1922 is of no use to them now. So Cosgrove has it, and I think because it, I'm sure they took it so they could rent it. Um, but I think because the show has been such a hit, the exhibition options have been, you know, that's what's happening now. Thank you for asking. Yes. <coughs> Outfits that maybe Lady Mary they had reappeared in more than one of the episodes, uh -huh. and you don't see that as much in some of the later seasons. And I wonder if, is that because of the show's popularity, and maybe does the budget of costumes grow? And what does the budget for costumes look like? Well, I said, didn't I say that at the beginning? Um, Thirty or forty thousand per episode, and each episode is filmed over thirteen days. I mean, each each um, evening that we see. I think that one thing, and I, I, again, it's one of those one of those things that I wanted to show you an example of, and I couldn't get the example, and I thought, you know, it'd be kind of boring to hear about it. But you're going to hear about it now. Is that what, what people did historically? I'm doing a show right now that's set in the 1920s at the college, and we're having a deuce of the time finding regular clothes. Like we can find all the beauty gowns. There are, but finding regular clothes is very difficult because what it is, and I think about it, the 19, so I'm going to say this and then I'll get back to your point. But the 1920s predated what? The Depression. So all of those clothes that were made out of like normal fabric, they went into quilts. They got recut into things. It went in throughout the history of fashion until really, I would say, the 80s, you know, relatively recently, because we're now such a disposable society. But women recut. So there are a lot of, you know, there are existing garments in different museums that really the original fabric dates back to a garment 1795. But then in 1803, it got recut into this. And, and what was great for a while was the clothes were really big and they kept getting smaller and smaller. Now then, then that stopped. So I, I think in answer to your question, there there is a there's a scene where Edith is on a tractor, and I think it's in season two. She's helping out a farm. She wears a jacket that she wore in season one as a nice little jacket. Um, and so you know, reusing the clothes makes sense, but I think sometimes aristocratic families would not be seen in the same thing uh, in, in, in certain contexts. <coughs> so I don't think there's any reason they wouldn't wear something again. And I think we probably saw Mary in the black and the black, it's, incidentally, I could never find a good image of it, but the black dress that she wears in that first episode after, you know, of season four, uh, the dress was made as, as a very good shadow copy of a wedding dress. It has a lot of the same seeming and details because they wanted to shadow that. And even though we didn't really see it, I, I thought it was a lovely sentiment. Anybody else? Yes. Um, two questions. The first one is, would uh, Lady Cora have allowed her daughters to have chosen their different things? I know for this series, the actors have done it. Uh -huh. Would Cora, the mother, have allowed her daughters to have chosen what they wanted if this was the real thing? In other words, you know, each Right, if it were it. historically at the time, when you say their things, you mean the dresses? That the dresses they, they would have chosen. Um, well, it would depend on the mother. And again, Lady Cora is an American mother, so she, just because of that, she's uh, more laid back. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that's, that's a great question. I think it depends on the mother. It depends on the daughters and the breeding of the daughters. I mean, certainly what we see, what we saw in the first two seasons was that Sybil, Sybil's taste was a little more extreme. Uh, then, and I do think that your typical Edwardian mother would never have permitted her daughter in polite society to have appeared in the boss knockoff. Well, you I could just, tell the father didn't like it. Yeah. I mean, he didn't yeah. argue because I think the, uh, his wife, the nice thing about Cora, yeah. was she helped finance the house. Right. So, right. you know, maybe that helped a little bit. No, absolutely. But I, I do think that, uh, but that's, again, that's why it's theater, too. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. And the only other thing I wish they would do that I miss here, even though this is maybe getting a little ridiculous and monotonous, I do like the preparation of the food. 
But one time when they were doing all the different dressing, one, all the things, I, I was listening to uh, Lady Mary and all of a sudden she was going to go to a store or something to think of looking at new clothes. And I was thinking, wait a minute, I don't get this. And then they replayed a thing where uh, a core was saying, well, we'll have somebody come and look. But I've had nobody, in other words, I don't know how they get dressed. I've seen no episode where Mary says, well, bring me some stuff so I can select it. Uh -huh. So I assume back then all the clothes were made for them somewhere. Yeah, no, that's a, that again, good question. I feel like I'm getting you A on your question. And, you know, um, the, the, at this time in history, people don't go to stores. Okay. I mean, there are, there are, in the 18, I think it's the 1860s in Paris, there is a department store that opens and it's like, ooh. But even stores are only selling things like uh, perhaps a camisole. I mean, uh, undergarment, and certainly people of their breeding and their stature. No, there are people, there's, there's a milliner, there's a dressmakers who do their clothes for them. They probably also, because of the, the family's status, especially when we begin the show, where before there's an economic, there's no economic drop yet. Uh, I'm sure they're having things made in Paris and sent, you know, oh, okay. um, or they go on a shopping trip in the season. To, to get the clothes. And women, uh, I don't doubt for a minute that Cora has a mannequin that is padded out to her exact size so that monsieur, whoever, can make that. What, what they would do is, I have a, a very good collection of antique magazines going back to about 1870. Um, and so there were fashion magazines from the, really from that time, even 1830s, we had the Gobies. Um, but there are fashion magazines that would, would go around that people, women could say, I would like with this mode. Um, and these fashion magazines, again, were not, uh, I mean, they weren't things you could order from. I mean, they were just more examples of design that a lady could say. Uh, prior to that, there were dolls. So that the dolls that we know as dolls actually had their origin in dolls that were sent throughout the continent to communicate what styles were being shown. And that's, you know, really goes way back historically in terms of that fashion communication. Anybody else? Well, yes? I'm just curious about the children's books. Yeah. <laughs> are, they, are they as accurate as they are with everybody else, or less because they're not seen as much? Or well, you know, there have been so little, our, our glances of the children have been like, you know, oh, so-and-so's in the, where the nanny is, and the nanny's bad, and they get rid of her. So the, I think we'll be seeing more of the kids because they're getting older now, and they made the picture. Um, but I, so I can't really speak to that. What I have seen is accurate. The, the issue with using children in film is there are such rigid laws about using them um, that that's part of why they get minimal play. Um, but I, and so far, it looks very realistic to me. I see no reason why they would cut corners in, in the historical accuracy of that. Uh, but you know, it's important to know that the, the designer herself, uh, Carolyn McCall, the designer for the last two years and running, um, has made the very clear point that she is not, her priority is not historical accuracy. Her priority is to project the period as, as accurately as possible while telling the story and, and serving the characters. So that there is always, you know, in this day and age, we can't do historical accuracy because we don't have the textiles that they have. We don't have the machines. You know, it's not going to be exactly right. It's more giving you that feeling. Yes? Can I just ask you something about your own work? You said you're working on a play now in the 1920s. And yes. You can't find those everyday clothes. Do you make them or we go to a house? Um, well, the answer for that is different today than it would have been three days ago. So um, it's, I, you know, I feel that, and I've done a lot, of, I've probably done like 250 shows. And so I've done a lot of them, and I, I find that the 20s is particularly difficult to replicate. Um, and because there's just such a, there's a softness, there's just such a, you know what I mean, the faculty. Um, there's an ease to them, there is a language character to the textiles and when they're when you're using authentic pieces that are very difficult to get with modern textiles. Um, especially if you want it's hard to get that kind of cotton. 
you know, you, you can get, you can still get a quality silk that has that softness to it. But um, there, the, 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 the play that I'm doing is kind of a sad little play that never got published for a reason, might I add. But I don't care. I don't care. But it's called Mendeley. If anyone here likes vaudeville or that kind of, um, it, it's about a, 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 a family on the Lower East Side, a Jewish family, 1929. You know, the, the father is an inventor. And so they're, they're kind of poor people. They're pretty poor people until he gets his patent gets bought and suddenly they're rich. So I, what's cool for me as a designer, I get to go from them looking really grubby and poor to being popular, but I, I'm having a sort of time finding normal clothes. Mm -hmm. And I have, yeah, my head could explode from him, from like the time I spent on eBay and Etsy. And, like, um, and it's hard to find normal clothes. So actually I found a source that I used years ago and hadn't in ages. Helen Upner has a costume company in Long Island that it specializes in 20th century, late 19th century, and the place is, oh my god, it's like a Russian tier of the costumes. It's extraordinary. <laughs> and so I called there thinking that the last time I used them, they were too expensive for us. And uh, they come down in price, and so I'm going there next weekend. Uh, and because I do, I want the stuff to have truth. And I find that even though my staff is very skilled in making clothes, it's the fabric is the problem. We just can't get the fabric that feels right. Um, and I think it's it's important to me that it has you know that right that character. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> How do they treat the shoes that the characters wear? And their authenticity and. In now, now, I think they have them custom made. I mean, they're at that at Capizio. Uh, when I was working in New York, you could have custom shoes done in Capizio for 200, 250, and I'm sure that the great thing about England and London is they got everybody who does everything, and so I'm sure that they're having uh, a lot of shoes built. And again, then they go to Costco and they can rent them out, you know. But I, I'm pretty sure that's probably what they do because the quality of the footwear they're using is exact. It's just stunning footwear, and. The age, there's no, there's no giveaway on the age of the stuff. See, what happens is that we can't, we're limited in terms of the durability of the garments, you know, that are historical. And then also, you know, and this is my, know that I'm joking, you know, uh, mothers, but I have wanted to preach, you know, the, the end of prenatal care. All women who are pregnant should be chain smoking and drinking heavily. That was a joke. Um, yeah, because babies are so damn big now. So my issue with the costume designer, I can't fit anybody into my period shoes, my period clothes, because they're gigantic. You know, but the average size of my students is like a 10 or 11. Stop it, you know? Sometimes these things were too small back then. Yeah. And get you so right, right. And that's the other piece of it. Things that do survive often survive for reasons. Like, you know, just like have we not ever gotten gifted clothes? We're going like, hell no, we're in that. <laughs> that. Yeah, that's 50 years from now. Someone's going to say, oh, here's a wonderful costume. Yeah, yeah, that is not. Yeah, yeah, that, the, the stuff that survives is often stuff that should not survive. <laughs> Any, anybody else? Yes. The answer to my question is probably another presentation. It was about this whole business of, of um, warehouses, of costumes, yes. and, and renting them out. We were told up to in Stratford, Ontario, that their costume warehouse is the biggest in North America, and they ran out. And of course, you've got the went called Nafra and, and Broadway. Uh huh. That's a huge business. You know, actually, it's a dying business. When I was in when I was a young in New York, I worked for Spent Mortgage, which, which was the largest costume company in the world at that time, and uh, which then went under and sold out. So the, the, the truth is, is that clothes. Because people are getting bigger and there, there just isn't a, a huge profit margin in it. But where they've done, where costume rental companies have, have had the greatest success is when they do opera. Like you can see an opera, you know, here that you'll see. I mean, it's the same costumes performing all these different operas all over the world. There's a very thriving, smart uh, rental business within the opera world. I, I think the costume rental companies 
will do better in the next 20 years because once they digitize their stuff, because it's difficult for people to travel and go and climb up on that ladder. Anybody else? I, and I'm gonna yeah. stop you here because I know you want to keep her. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, can I just say, you are just the best audience ever. Thank you so much.